Um, can you hear me? There hey. we go. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. No, that's I'm okay. It said you couldn't join, and I was like, oh, this is only my second time. I've done something wrong already. <laughs> no, it's fine. I was in your DMs trying to see if I was going to get the request there, and so maybe that's why I shouldn't have been. <laughs> it's my fault. I take the blame totally. Well, How thank you, you so much for joining me today. Of I know you've course. been talking back and we've been talking back and forth. And I just want to say thank you. You've been so inspirational and a huge um, guidance to me on this crazy journey of social media. So yeah, yeah it's, it's quite a journey. I mean, I, I'm still learning and I feel like I will always be learning. So thank you so much. Thank you. Well, the technology is always changing, so I'm sure I'll mess something up again soon. So I know. For, it's those, fine. for those of us who don't, for those of, that are joining that don't know you, which I'm sure they all do, would you mind just giving a little background, your education, yeah. where you're at currently, all the good things? Sure. So I am a traditionally trained uh, nutritionist and dietitian. So I have my bachelor's and my master's, the internship, the whole thing. I became a licensed dietitian. And then I moved to the United States to start my PhD in exercise physiology at the University of Miami. So I've done that. I've got my doctorate in exercise physiology with and nutrition and a certified personal trainer. I've worked with the American College of Sports Medicine, um, preparing students, trainers to become personal trainers. Um, I've taught at the University of Miami throughout my whole, like the five years that I was there getting my doctorate. I was teaching nutrition and exercise physiology courses. And then I started teaching at Miami Dade College after, uh, well, even before I graduated, actually I started. And up until now I teach uh, on my at Miami Dade uh, College, and mainly though, I'm a, I consider myself a content creator. So mainly, I'm focusing on YouTube and Instagram, and just putting out content. And uh, the content is very at odds <laughs> with what I was actually taught was the optimal diet, which was you know the high carb, high plant foods. And I obviously realized that that was so wrong, and how fooled we were everybody was brainwashed from being a student to you know really throughout my whole academic uh career yeah. yeah so so yeah so i recommend a carnivore diet as the optimal human diet and the vast majority of my content tends to focus on that although it's not the only content like i don't want to be boxed in into like i right. only talk about carnivore like no no no, no. i mainly want to be a content creator and just share what i believe in and it just seems it just happens to be that I'm a nerd. <laughs> yeah. all the science. I think so. all of us in the carnivore space have kind of like become very nerdy because we are in a conflict all the time. There's a battle against, hey, this is what we've been taught since probably kindergarten. And yeah. this is what we're slowly learning. And so there's that need to be very, very edu educated on the subject or else you're going to get eaten alive, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think yeah. we've all bonded and in that nerdy type of way because you have to you have yeah, to. exactly well put yes now when you were teaching I, I know your 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 teaching now is probably a little bit different but when you were in university and you're studying and you're teaching as like a student teacher a TA whatever it was yeah. were you teaching the traditional like food pyramid and what we've been yeah. taught so even to this, well, when I first started teaching, I still wasn't, you know, because that, that was what, in 2012 when I moved to Miami. And so I was still dipping my toes into the keto diet first. I like, Even before that, I was still doing like orange juice and toast because that's what I was taught. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought that that was healthy. So um, it really took a while for me to eventually like evolve from the keto to carnivore diets. And so around that time I had already started teaching at Miami Dade College, right? And I do have to give them the basics. So I do have to give them like the pyramid and you know the grades yeah. and stuff. But at the same time I get to criticize it as well and tell them why it's wrong. So they get to have everything like both ends of the spectrum, understanding why the mainstream is like what are the main recommendations that the mainstream goes by and why that's wrong. Um, but they do have to know the basics, like, because eventually a lot of them end up uh, becoming nurses. A lot of my students end up becoming nurses. Yeah. And so eventually they're going to go and work in a hospital setting and they're going to see how a diabetic patient is being given high carb 
meal at a hospital and then given the insulin. And so I don't want them to lose their marbles. So I want them to be prepared. So yeah. But it's planting the seed like, hey, this is what I have to teach you. But there's also this, you know, yeah. this viewpoint as well. You it's up to you to decide. Yeah, well, they're very lucky that they get to learn that because I did not learn that stuff in college. It was very much like A, B, C, D. This is the way it is. We're not like that's just the way it is yeah. um, every even my best friend is a doctor and even he is very into the keto space too he's the one who got me into it and he's like I I you know I went to school for I mean he's going on what 10 12 years of schooling and he's like no one ever taught me this I never learned this stuff it's all self-taught so yeah, to this day, they still don't teach it. it it's yeah. mind blowing. It really is. It's, it's, and what a shame. I mean, to spend all the money and the years and the effort going through schooling, whether it's nutrition or whether it's becoming a physician, and to then realize that you have been literally given what the pharmaceutical industry would love for you to know, you know, what are the yeah. drugs, and how to treat them. And those are the drugs or combination of drugs. And boom that's the end of that it's yeah. it's quite you know it's a hard it's a tough pill to swallow when you finally see the light you know and it's and like I, wow it's like, at least it's I, so much time it's such a disappointment i think the hard part is is that you're uh, you're i mean technically you're a scientist you are a, a type of scientist and doctors they're all these types of scientists and the whole point is question everything um yeah. i have a friend on here and her like whole mantra is eat meat question everything and it's we haven't been that critical thinking skill has been totally taken out of science yes. um, in yeah. mainstream education media today. So yeah. it's, it's, it is a little scary. Do you get pushback from your students or the faculty? Like, have you ever had conflict because of that? Because I can't imagine that you haven't had just an ounce of I had, a, I, had a, I had a fully fledged vegan last semester who took my course and he was so excited at the beginning. He was like, oh, this is going to be so much fun. You know, like the, the guy is like, has already a master's, you know, in, uh, in I think, in, in some scientific um, thing, you know. And he knew like all the studies, all this stuff. And he would like send me only the studies that, you know, prove his points. And of course, there are so many more studies um, done on plant-based uh, diets be simply because that's the inherent bias that all uh, professors already have. Like most people already believe that, you know, that is the way to go. And so let's just formulate that kind of study. Nobody has ever bothered or had the courage to go against the mainstream and actually come up with a study that looks at the effects of a carnivore diet. Right. So yeah, there, you know, there are, there is pushback, of course. Um, but I think over time, people learn not to mess with you. And <laughs> you don't uh, mess with Dr. Sarah. <laughs> don't, don't try. You know too much. You're too <laughs> smart. But how did you, okay, so everything you talk about goes against this whole, basically everything you've been taught. How did you evolve to, you said you were keto and I mean, I've, I've heard your story because I watch all your videos, but for people watching, it's kind of, I mean, that's like one extreme to the other. You are a traditionally yeah. taught nutritionist to now like a, a pretty strict carnivore. So yeah. how did you how, get there? Uh, I mean, slowly but surely, I, I would every time, like I wouldn't, I would have cravings or I would, you know, fall off the wagon or feel like I don't have energy or have brain fog or things like that. I would, my the way that I deal with things anytime a setback happens is that I just immerse myself and I educate myself and I go off on a binge of like books and podcasts and stuff. Yeah. And so every time I would do that, I would learn something new, you know, and every time like after I, after I realized, Oh, keto, Oh my God, this is so cool. And then I realized like, that's not like the complete answer. Um, so I keep, keep watching and stuff. And then eventually I think I came across, uh, the plant paradox by Dr. Stephen yeah. Gundry. And then from there I was like, Whoa, this is crazy stuff. So then I watched the Joe Rogan, you know, podcast with um, Sean Baker, mm -hmm. uh, the Petersons, you know, I feel like everybody yeah. did that, was exposed to that, and that's how we became carnivores, at least like us recent carnivores. So that's how it started. And then once you, once that plant is seeded, it, once that seed is planted, <laughs> then it keeps growing and growing, you know? And it's just, it was like the natural next step. 
And then, of course, another personal experience, like with my husband having a very low, very severe low back pain that was complete, like for decades, you know, to the point where he needed surgery that he really was trying not to get because it was so risky. And eventually realizing that just cutting out the spinach, that was like the only plant food that he had in his diet, <laughs> realizing that cutting out the spinach completely eliminated back pain that was has it, been with him for decades. The oxalates? Was it the, the oxalates? The oxalates. Oh, okay, so, okay. Yeah, because he had the same experience. We all thought, oh, it must be the oxalates. But then um, when he would eat corn on Thanksgiving once a year, the same thing, like after we had come completely stopped, like he had already recovered from his low back pain, we go to North Carolina for, um, you know, his family to spend it with them. And we had the corn pudding that his mom makes and the low back pain came back with a vengeance. It was like, what is the different, like, or what did you have, what did you do differently? Because he only ate meats, you know, plus the corn. And that's how, you know, I dove into the research to try and figure out what's the common theme there. And that's how I discovered aquaporins. I'd never heard of it before. I so. have only heard of it because of you. I like, in all the stuff that I've researched, it's usually like the big ones, like lectins, oxalates, and um, what is it? Um, an alcohol, ferment, like fermented meats, uh, histamines like that's like the big ones people talk about yeah yeah, no, so much. Re yeah there is a lot and people don't understand yeah. um that not everything that comes from the ground is good for you if any no. of it um i resonate with that i started i was keto for five years i lost a ton of weight i was like a diehard keto person and then after i had my second son i started having like painful bladder syndrome i'm not sure if you're familiar with that but um, all my ladies will know, a U it felt like a UTI, but I did not have a UTI. And so months and months and months of dealing with this, I'm keto, I'm like eating clean. And the doctor was like, you have a food intolerance that is probably triggering this, try ABCD elimination diet. And after eliminating all the things that he told me, I was still having it. And I looked at my husband and I just said, I'm in so much pain, I'm just gonna eat meat. And that's what I did. And I have almost no flare-ups if I don't drink enough water I'll have a flare-up but like it's like your husband if I have wow. that wrong food like that it's just like yeah it's, it's the it's so, so many. painful yeah if you have any kind of like strange symptom where it's not like very common or it's just something that's like dampening your overall quality of life the first thing that i would do is just do strict keto at least do it for 30 days ideally for 90 days see what happens and then you don't have to stay like that for life i mean if you absolutely feel like you want to try something else try something else but then watch for symptoms right and that like that active experimentation is going to give you all the answers that you need you know yeah yeah for me i think it was the oxalates because um you know oxalates and kidneys are like hand in hand, I am convinced that I have little crystallizations that I was passing through, um, like the urinary tract system. So right. I completely resonate that I, I just I do not want to be on pain medicine. It's so bad for you. So yeah, it is insane. Just and, like and, little and just for logic, it's like, let's not figure out what the root cause is. Let, let's just give you pills to dampen the pain. Right. It's like, really, that's your answer. And unfortunately, that is the answer that traditional or mainstream medicine is for 99% of the ailments that right. people are struggling with, which are issues that are chronic and they're just lowering their quality of life. They're not like, not, not like 1% maybe only of um ph physician business or like er or things that are right. like that you know yeah and unfortunately mainstream conventional medicine is great at if you do have an accident right it's great for those kinds of things like if i get hit by a bus you know take me take me to a or doctor you just fine. need help with childbirth it's like that's what it should be revolving <laughs> around but exactly it's not. Exactly. So yeah, well, you know, this is why I'm so glad that we have so many more people like you that are getting this information, applying it and actually seeing results. And now we get to share and share because I feel like it has to come from us because otherwise those institutions, they are so like they have that, that herd mentality that everybody writes the same grant over and over and over again. When I worked at the University of Miami for a while, um, like a couple of years ago, and I, um, they wanted to take my advice with regards to what kind of diet to prescribe, and to, like, they were doing a new wellness center for the project of to cure paralysis. It's at the University of Miami. It's like this huge institution, and they get all kinds of funding 
to cure paralysis. But, you know, they're asking me, as, as they're the nutritionists on board, what should the diet be? And I'm telling them all this stuff and I'm excited. And then at the end, they go out and they just go with a Mediterranean diet. I'm like, just tell me, just like, be, be honest with me. It's because you're not going to get funding, right? You just want to get funding whichever way possible. And it's like, yeah, that's the answer. They're only going to get funding if they write about the, the Mediterranean diet. And if they do something else, it's actually more, much more likely to help those people. Um, they're, you know, and all they care about at the end is just to have a job and to have, to have money coming in. And that's the end of that. And so it's really yeah. disappointing. It's like, especially as an educator for me, I'm just like, I'm just a mom. I'm just a regular person who is sharing the journey, but like, you're an educator, you're in like the brunt of it. You're in the heat of it. And so like, I'm sure you just want to go, ah, like it's so annoying. I know. No, that's why I quit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. How often are you teaching classes now? So I teach, I'm teaching three sections in the fall. We literally just finished the second summer. So, so basically I teach as an adjunct. So I'll teach okay. nine classes in a year. So right. three classes in the fall, four classes in the spring, two classes in the summer. Okay. All right. That's so it. it's more of like, I know we called our adjunct professors more of like part time, like they're part -time. more of like, I am part time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They offered me a full time position, but I was like, do I really want to do that? I, you know, and I have to go to all the meetings where I'm about to like blow my brains out and just I feel like it's a waste of time. And the money isn't like what for an extra 20, 30k. Yeah. And then yeah. I won't have any time to build my brand. So I declined and that's why I do what I do. Well, good. We're happy you are in this full time because I know you, I've been watching you since the beginning. I think Bella Steak and Butter Gal, Dr. Anthony Chafee, and you were like the first three that I was like, huh, like I'm just going to eat meat. And I literally went to Google and was like, all meat diet. You know what I mean? And that, then that was so way, cool. pulled up your YouTubes and I was just like, all right, I'm sold. So it's like it. crazy to be here with you. I'm very thankful. I'm um, so happy. What about fruit what is this is very controversial in this space what is your opinion <laughs> on fruit okay if you have a few pounds to lose if you have diabetes or pre-diabetes or if you have any skin condition eczema psoriasis acne anything i recommend everybody starts off with a base of just meat okay and i'm not saying just red meat like you can do pork you can do salmon you can do eggs you can do bacon you can do all that kind of stuff do whatever you know any kind of meats chicken turkey do right. that you know shrimp lobster this is all great but after 30 to 90 days if you feel like you know you're you've achieved your optimal body weight you've achieved everything you know you're you're feeling great and you really, really missed something like fruit, you could try and see, does it cause an eczema outbreak? Does it cause acne? Does it cause whatever it is? It's not, in my opinion, the optimal diet. It, they still have anti-nutrients, and I still feel like the, the research is so lacking in that area because it's, it has, it's never been a thought to actually study what happens when you consume those anti-nutrients. They, they literally look at them as antioxidants. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah. there's like those, the same things that we are so scared of because they're anti-nutrients, they're literally elevated in the plant-based world and that a lot of nutrition researchers look at them as antioxidants and how can we have more of them, not less? So because of the lack of research looking at how those anti-nutrients, like for example, in fruits, you've got salicylates. They are antifungals. They are literally present to defend the fruit from predators, insects, you know, and, and fungal or mold overgrowth. So until we have studies that actually look at that and look at how that affects a human being over the long term, we can't say for, I can't, be like 100% positive and tell you, you know, um, it's going to be, it's, it's okay or it's bad. But nutrition is more of a philosophy as it stands because it's so difficult to run trials and to have the real high quality, long, long, long term studies that would actually give us right. real answers. We have to try and figure out the answers using our history, our evolutionary history, using, you know, um, paleontology and 
all that kind of stuff. And so we never, throughout history, for 99.99% of our existence, we never had access to this amount of fructose in our diet. We evolved during an ice age, and even the fruits that were available there uh, during that period of time, they were very low in sugar and very high in fiber. So we never had access to that very sweet taste. All these fruits on the market, they've all been hybridized right. and, you know, like chosen to be very, very sweet and, and addictive. And so is a fruit going to be better than a Snickers bar for somebody who has already six pack abs and very physically active and young? Yeah. Yeah. But is a piece of steak better? Yes. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah. So and we, so I be very careful. Very yeah. careful. Where I get base, I'm not I'm not a nutritionist. I don't have that background, but I love nutrition and I have um my grandma passed away from complications of diabetes. I have some diabetics in my family where I get very concerned with mainstream people recommending fruit in um unison with a high fat diet is for like you mentioned that never existed in nature you were not going to get um like a mammoth and eat all that fat and then go home and eat some berries too it was really one or the other when you got that berry produce whatever you could find you were going to gorge yourself maybe like once you know Um, so when people are recommending like all the sugar in in unison with all the high fat that's actually I think that's the problem with the standard American diet. There's yeah. a lot of fat in a lot of things, but there's a lot of sugar. And when you put those two together, it's catastrophe. You know, am I wrong? That's what I think. Um, that's yeah, and what that's I've how learned. you activate. No, spot on. And that's how you activate the Randall cycle, which is like right. a series of chemical reactions that occur when you combine the sugar and fat, like two energy sources at the same time, and they're very addictive. In addition to that, and that's and so, when you store the most fat too. One hundred percent, one hundred percent. So yeah, that's why I, I just, I would prefer that we don't don't do fruit. You heard it yeah, from Dr. From most Sarah. people, yes, don't. It's not, you know, it's not this optimal nutrition. You still have things um, like toxins in addition to the salicylates. Like for example, mangoes uh, have erythritol, which is the same toxin found in, in cashews, right? Um, that's why you can't just go and eat raw cashews. You live, even when you think you're buying raw cashews, it's been they steamed. Been, yeah, very high steamed. temperatures, yeah. That's why most of the time it says roasted too. Yes, yes, on top of that. But even even the bag that you go to Trader Joe's, you get raw cashews. That's, you know, people think it's raw. It's not raw. It's been steamed in order to remove whatever leftover erythritol has uh, penetrated into the nut. Because the erythritol is concentrated in the shell of the cashew, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but it is so toxic that the, they're so scared that some of it can be, you know, present on the nut or has seeped into the nut. Um, and so that's why they have to take all of these precautionary measures in order to deactivate it. Well, mangoes has that too, like in the skin, but it's, you can literally, if a pet goes by the fruit and touches it, it gets it on its skin and then it can give it to you. Like it's that difficult to get rid of. And wow. people think like, oh, it's fine. Let's just eat it. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, it's the same thing with, no. what is it? Um, like beans, like beans are actually incredibly toxic to eat if you don't cook them. Um, yeah. This is the part of this is the part of like evolutionary eating that I think is so people we don't learn this. So I was reading, I can't remember which book it was. Maybe it was one of Dr. Gundry's books, um, his latest keto one, where we eat like okay. quinoa and all these things. And we think we're being super nutritious. But right. our ancestors who were in um, South America, the indigenous, they fermented that stuff for forever to cook out and get all those toxins out because quinoa is actually really bad for you if you don't cook it the right way. But no one knows that. Like we, yeah. what was it like 10 years ago? Quinoa was the superfood. They were putting right. it in everything. So right. yeah, people I, just I don't know. Like- still to this day, the vast majority of people think, still think that quinoa is great, right? I mean, you go, I think Starbucks sells on the regular quinoa-based salads. I mean, it's everywhere. It's, you can get me to eat it. 
No, no. I'd well, rather eat rice. I, like. I, I fell for that. I used to buy quinoa. Even when I moved to the States before I started keto, like I thought, oh, this is healthy, you know, and I would buy bags of quinoa, different colors, <laughs> different types. I never liked it. I was like, oh, this does not taste good. But I, yeah, w what can you say? Like they just shove it down your throat and there's like, there's so many, kale's like the fun one now, like kale's superfood, it's been like that for a while, and it's so you, gross. You have dietitians, you have people in authority figures that are scientists that are coming out and talking about how it's a superfood, or like writing blogs and articles, and it's like, yeah, I mean, of course, you think, okay, that's a dietitian who wrote this article, she must it know what to be true. Talking. It has to be true, and, and what percentage of scientists or doctors are ever mentioning plant toxins or ever right. talking about a carnivore diet. What, 0. 0.000, like right. I can literally count them on my hands. And so it's a long road. It's a long journey. It's going to be a long road ahead. Um, yeah. I know that you are strapped for time. So I have just a couple more things, if you wouldn't mind. One sure. of my favorite topics in the entire world to talk about is anti-aging. When I was <laughs> 12 years old and I was getting to that point where I was going to hit puberty. My grandma came to visit us and she sat me down and she gave me this really expensive skincare kit. And she goes, look, you get to my age and it's too late. Everything anti-aging is too late. So you need to start now and you're going to look like you're 20 years younger than what you really are. I have never slept with my makeup on. I have always had a super intense skin regimen. So I know you like to talk about this too, which is it. like, I love yeah. these, these anti-aging talks. What are some things we can do to reduce our age? Like exercise, I know you can talk about the science behind that a little bit. Yeah. Just simple yeah. things every day that we can do so that we look 10 years younger than what we are. So like you said, exercise is probably the number one thing you can do because as you age, one of the main hallmarks of aging that literally drives the aging process is the accumulation of um, certain kinds of cells called zombie cells, and that's the sexy name. The scientific name is called senescent cells. Okay. And so there's a lot of research and money being poured in to discover drugs called senolytics, lytics like breaking down the senescent cells. Well, exercise is the best senescent or senolytic drug that you can have because it literally destroys those zombie cells. Those zombie cells are simply cells that have gotten old, but they hang around and instead of completely like being excreted from your system, they just hang around and um, they can't function normally but they continuously produce inflammatory molecules into your blood. So they're constantly secreting inflammatory molecules into your blood. Would that be like free, is that like associated with free radicals? Like those, they, that's like a very popular term that people like to throw around. And yeah. it's one of those terms people are like, what are free radicals? Because it's very yeah. general. It's very broad. It's, it's so. just a highly reactive molecule okay. that can react with things it has no business reacting to, like your DNA or a cell membrane um, okay. or any structure in your body, because it's a molecule that has one unpaired electron. And for any chemical structure, I'm so sorry, don't kill us, we're going to the chemistry, but. <laughs> no, I love it. I, I should have majored in science, but I didn't think I was smart enough. And now I, I'm like, oh, darn it, missed we're, opportunity. Oh, we're, all, we're all smart enough, trust me. I just, I just wouldn't sleep at night just studying. That, that's how we got. <laughs> It's not like I, you know. So um, any chemical structure that has one unpaired electron is constantly looking for another electron to marry, you know, yeah. to have that bond. Uh, because whenever you have two electrons bonded together in the outer shell of a molecule, that's when you have a stable molecule and that's what we want. Right. But whenever you have inflammation in the body, you have, like what you mentioned, a lot more of those um, free radicals, reactive oxygen species, there are so many of them, um, that can um, start to interact and form that bond with like your DNA or other chemical or cellular membranes. You shouldn't be fond. You shouldn't be bonding with those structures, right? And this is what these mutations. This is what could lead to all kinds of damage and right. accelerated aging is a big one. So, um, exercise can to go back to the initial point we're talking about. It destroys those senescent cells or those zombie cells, which means less 
inflammatory molecules being released into your blood and so also less of those um, free radicals. Um, that's one thing. Um, taking you or having optimal levels of vitamin D and omega threes. If you're in the optimal range, you can literally reset or reverse your biological age. Um, I don't know if any, if the probably a lot of our audience probably already knows about this, but at the end of your chromosomes, which houses your DNA, you have um, telomeres. Yeah. So let's say this is a chromosome, right? They look like X's. You've got twenty three of them. So. At the end of every chromosome, like look at the like where I have my nails. Uh -huh. the, think of those as like the kind of like how shoelaces have plastic caps at the end of them that protect them from fraying. It's the exact same thing. So think of those nails as the telomeres, which are like the caps, you know, of, of the shoelaces, and they protect the chromosomes from damage. And you have them, by the way, on also on the bottom ends right. as well right on all ends and as you age meaning as time goes by and your cells divide and divide the length of those telomeres start going shorter and shorter and shorter until eventually you don't have enough telomeres which means that now your dna is exposed and now it, it really starts to have mutations and starts getting damaged and you have cancer and heart disease and all those things that are the result of that aging process but they have found that people who have optimal levels of vitamin D, so for example, just in vitamin D, you can add five years to your life just by having an optimal range of vitamin D in your blood. So imagine that's just one nutrient. Imagine what would happen if you optimize for every yeah. other right the fish oil is a big one that's been published shows that you know low, uh, the higher your omega-3 status the shorter sorry the longer your telomeres which is what you want so there's so much carbohydrates when you eat carbs it increases something called advanced glycation and products or ages i think the pun was intended <laughs> <laughs> so those ages or advanced glycation and products are literally the glucose that you've just eaten from the carbohydrates going throughout your whole system and attaching to things like collagen um, and all kinds of other structures. But like if we want to talk just looks, then it attaches to collagen and weakens that collagen matrix. And so now you have jowls and you have drooping and, you know, sagging skin. So the number one thing you would want to do to reverse the aging process and slow it down as much as possible is cut out the carbohydrates. Okay. You, one big question, because you're located in Florida, yes? Yes, Ocala right now. Yes. The sun. What about the sun? Because this is also something I see a lot. Like right now, sunscreen is like trending in skincare. Everyone's cover yeah. up everything. Yeah. What What is your opinion on that? Okay. I use sunscreen. I never leave the house without sunscreen. Yes, on my face. Yes. If we go, we're going on a mini vacation next weekend um, to Daytona and we're going to be like in the sun for like four days and the sun is brutal. I will have sunblock. Um, but here's the thing. It's not the sun that's causing the wrinkles. It's the sun damage, right? Okay. What causes the sun damage? Unfortunately, most of the time I'm cooped up working from home. I'm not out in the sun, you know, building up a natural tan, a natural defense system against the sunburn. So because I'm not constantly out and about gradually building a natural tan, when I just go from being a month of not seeing the sun a lot and then go on a mini vacation where the sun is brutal in Florida, I'm going to get burned, right? Yeah. And so I don't want to get burned. And that's why I use the sunblock and the sunscreen. Okay. So um, if you're able to get out in the sun, I, I went out on a boat trip. I'm a little red, but not, it looks red, but it's actually not terrible in person. It just looks way worse on camera. I like build up, like I build up color very, very quickly. But of course, I mean, I live in Virginia right outside of DC. Our, sun is very minimal during the uh the winter so i get very pale and then once i get that first exposure done i usually just get tanner and tanner and tanner so it's you don't you want to build up slowly is that what you're, that's exactly. what you're saying build okay. it up slowly don't think that oh i've heard that you know some luck is poison it's toxic yeah, yes of yeah. course we've got a lot of that stuff i agree but don't think that you can just wing it from like one day to the other and just, you know, don't get sunburned is the message. Another major thing when you remove the seed oils from your diet, those are things like the canola, vegetable oils, you know, all of the crap that you know you're not supposed to put in your yeah. body. 
then your skin um, will not be fried, you know, from the inside out. And also when you're choosing what products to use, I, I wish I can give you more information about that or if I knew like which um, brands do that, but, they're, but when you're choosing what personal care products to use, unfortunately, the vast majority of them are using um, plant oils as a yeah. base, right? And you do not want that kind of oil that is okay. so unstable that damages and oxidizes so quickly right. to be on your skin in direct contact with the sun. So okay. those are things that we need to think about. That helps me too, because I'm like trying to get my tan in, but I'm also like, I'm also trying not to age. So that is really, really helpful. Um, we did have one question because I want to let you go. I yeah. know you're on a time crunch. Um, Christine Shadle asked, um, what do you eat on a day in carnivore? Like what is your go-to meals? I share a lot on my YouTube channel. So I have a lot of like what I eat in a day, but it changes a lot. So like a few months ago, I had a what I, what I eat in a day or what I eat on vacation. And I had, let's say, fruits in there. And now I don't do fruits anymore. So, you know, it changes a lot. But now, for example, today, this morning, I woke up, I had a lot of bacon, six slices of bacon, four eggs, sunny side up. Um, and then I'm going to have ground beef later today. Um, and probably with a couple of slices of baby Swiss cheese. Okay. Um, and then after that, um, I'm going to have more of the same for dinner. <laughs> I'm just trying to force myself to eat at maintenance, not be in a caloric deficit today because it's my recovery day. Um, but, you know, it's just me, literally lots, meat, lots eggs, of, bacon. Those are the most common foods that I eat. Do you eat lots of beef? Because I know I'm predominantly yeah. beef. There will be days where I'm like, oh, I could, I really want chicken wings or chicken thighs. But 90% of what I eat is yeah. beef. I love chicken wings and thighs. I'm just too lazy because I just like buy in bulk and I just buy ground beef. Uh, but I, you know, now that you mentioned it, I'm like, oh, it was my recovery day. I should have bought some wings. <laughs> See, like, yeah, it doesn't even yeah. I, yeah. My, new, my new obsession is um, I just buy chicken thighs. I don't do anything except for maybe like a little bit of salt, throw them in the air fryer, and I'll cook like a whole family size package. And I think it's like 12 yeah. minutes on each side. And then I keep them in there and I just snack on them like all week. It's like, that's mm -hmm. where, that's where the money's at right there. It's like, that's what that's I want. I've heard so many people talk about the wings from, um, what's this, this play Buffalo wild wings where they have, they have like the vinegar wings. Yeah, that and they I fry their love. wings in beef tallow. Oh, so yeah. there's no yeah. vegetable oil. Like we have don't you tried have, them? Huh? Have you tried them? Buffalo Wild Wings? Yeah. No, like the ones in beef tallow. Yeah, I guess you grew up here. So yeah, I, <laughs> of course. Yeah, the Buffalo, yeah, Buffalo Wild Wings. That was actually when I started keto, that was like my go-to restaurant. Cause I was like, oh, I know I can have chicken wings and they're cooked in beef tallow. Cause I have always been super conscious about um, the seed oils and right. that's like the safest place to go get them. So yeah, I'm sure they're everywhere in Florida. I actually lived in Florida for yeah, like right. a year or two and I, recall going to a buffalo wild wings but i lived near fort myers i so that's where i went i don't know i don't think that's super close to you guys so you'll um, have to go well, I, I lived for like nine years in miami so i well i visited fort myers we went on like a, another mini vacation which you know wasn't that great <laughs> <laughs> i went to fort myers once um i do remember um going to buffalo wild wings when like that first semester i came to to miami i had a roommate that because i was my first semester you know go yeah. to school and everything. i was like let's I, I didn't even know if i could afford the living here because i it was like the first time i left lebanon right and um so anyway it, it, we only lasted one semester <laughs> She was from Virginia too. But I was like, ooh. Anyway, so I remember going once to the Buffalo um, place thing and then we went to the movies, but I was still, you know, I had no clue, like, right. you know, all that kind of stuff. Like, I ate crap, you know? Yeah, they're, so. I just get them naked. Like, I get them extra crispy, naked with no sauce because, like, when you get that crisp on the chicken, it's like, that is just, that's the sweet spot. That's why I don't like chicken breast that much. It's not like crunchy. So exactly. yeah, that crisp is delicious. You'll have to let me know when you get your Buffalo Wild. I will. Well, I will tag you. <laughs> <laughs> she said, thank you for answering the what you eat. Oh, today. absolutely. You're welcome. All right. I am going to ask one last question and then I'm letting sure. you get to your day. For someone who is new to the carnivore space, what is your number one piece of advice that you'd like to give? 
Oh, somebody who is new to the carnivore. Um, you might end up falling off the wagon multiple times um, because you're dealing with addiction. You know, like uh, any other food for the most part that you've probably been eating is probably has been addictive. And just know like from the addiction research, we know that it takes an average of five times for people to completely quit, right? And really be successful. So I would say persistence that's it like you have to be relentless in it and every time set a goal okay now i lasted this amount of days now i'm gonna last longer yeah you know um and then eventually i feel like after two weeks most people are good to go for the most part there is no more cravings or, or tendencies get it out of the house that's like my yeah. thing it's just like don't out of sight out of mind get it out of the house it's gonna be painful to throw away you're gonna have that itch after dinner when you want your sweet but that's an awesome piece of advice. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much. This has been wonderful. I'm so glad we got to connect. Guys, thank you for all your guidance. And I'm sure if we have any questions flowing in, I'll like forward them to you or someone can comment them on the video. Yeah. Yes. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Have a great day. Thank you all. You too. Bye. Bye. Bye.